Anxiety Q&A. In case you missed it, on last Sunday at church, we looked at 1 Peter 5, verses 6 to 7, which says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Unsurprisingly, this meant I spent some time preaching about being anxious. This was a bit of a live issue for us in our cultural moment, because anxiety is a growing problem in many of our lives. There was limited time to get into the weeds of this topic, and thus when speaking from the pulpit, one must take care not to stray from what God has clearly communicated. In the following days, there have been some great follow-up questions that tease out some of the implications, plus some questions that flow from things that I didn't elaborate on. Following are some of those questions and answers. I hope you may find them beneficial as we consider this topic. Here, I'm not writing from the pulpit, that is, I'm not writing with divine authority, but speaking from what I understand to be the implications of the scriptures and a biblical worldview. I'm convinced of these things, but your consciences need to be bound to the word, not my opinions. Question. What do you mean by worldly mental health? When I was preaching, I said, too many of us have become deceived by the world on this front. We view our anxieties not through the lens that God has given us to view them, but often we will default to a worldly lens. We use mental health language. We go to worldly counsellors and doctors to address our anxiety and do not consider seriously what God has called us to, the antidote that he has given us, and what he specifically says on this matter. Instead, we accept platitudes and prescriptions rather than going to the physician of our souls. End quote. Looking at these comments from a certain angle, one might assume I'm opposed to doctors, counsellors and mental health language. This is not the case. The key word here is worldly as opposed to godly. I was referring to the tendency of many Christians to take on board a worldly set of assumptions and treatments and to heed the wisdom of mental health professionals instead of seeing things through God's revelation. Mental health can be, not always, a cover for ignoring God's word and validating unhealthy or sinful behavior. In this case, we're looking with specific reference to anxiety, but there is a broader principle at work here. Mental health is not something that has magically appeared, and it's not as though God was unaware of it or didn't care about it. Instead, he has provided what we need for the flourishing of saints down through the ages, including those who face great trials of the mind. Physical or mental treatment should be subservient to God's ways, not an alternative to them. God cares for us, and he made us, and he has complete power over the universe. He should be our first and most trustworthy source for healing and wholeness. Question. Is seeking help from counsellors, doctors or medications unnecessary or sinful? No. It's not always unnecessary or sinful to seek help from counsellors, doctors or medication, but it can be, especially if we are seeking these things in place of seeking the Lord. Medicine is a gift from the Lord to be received with thankfulness and used to glorify Him. Medicine is for healing, but it cannot heal our spiritual illnesses, so to speak. When we turn to medicine to address symptoms that flow from spiritual issues, we will not find true healing and wholeness. We often just cover up the issue. With a topic like anxiety, God has specifically spoken to it and told us what to do about it, and so we should approach the issue from God's clear perspective. We are meant to be embodied spiritual beings, so I'm not trying to drive a wedge between our physical and spiritual selves. We are whole persons who need holistic treatment, healing for mind, body, and soul, as it were. Question. 
What about people who suffer anxiety attacks? Is it a sin if a person has no control over it? Now, we must make a distinction here between something that arises that we have no control over and what we do in response. Our sin is not in something that we are subjected to, rather in how we act or react to stimuli. In the case of anxiety, the issue is not that we feel a certain way, feel certain worries or concerns rising, but whether or not we trust God with them when they arrive. To belabor the point, the sin of pride under worry is not about the stuff that pops into our mind unbidden, but what we do with it once it's there. We are called to cast those cares on God as Jesus commands, as an imperative in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, do not be anxious. If a worry arises and I do not deal with it, but instead entertain it and let it fester, I'm being prideful. If I feel a rising anxiety, what should I do with the feeling? Let it bury me or cast it onto the one who cares for me. Herein is the trap. It is a devilish lie to think that we are passive victims of our sins. Each of us have sins that may be more challenging because of training, trauma, physiology or the like. The one who is predisposed to eat or drink too much must bring their desires into subjection. The one who is attracted to somebody of the same gender or someone who is not their spouse must respond to those feelings by turning away from them and to the Lord. When feelings of covetousness arise in us, we need to deal with them. The same goes for anxiety. When it hits us, how will we respond? 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 5 says, Take every thought captive to obey Christ. The natural mechanism behind anxiety is a good gift from God. It causes us to Check if the stove is turned off to reach out to that loved one going through a rough time. Be careful not to cause hurt to others. Put savings in the bank for a rainy day or long for the return of our Lord. Yet it is when this good mental system takes the helm and becomes a snare for us, we must take action and take that action that God says is good for us. Question. I feel like I'm losing my battle with anxiety. What should I do? In all of this discussion about facing anxiety, including those for whom it may be particularly difficult, we understand that the only way we can triumph against these temptations is with the Spirit at work in us. Although God says, do not be anxious, He sends His Spirit to sanctify us in this area because He loves us. We're not left to defend, sorry, we're not left to fend for ourselves. I take comfort in these verses. Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me when I was in a besieged city. I had said in my alarm, I'm cut off from your sight. But you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. That's from Psalm 31 verses 21 and 22. When circumstances fall on us, besieging us, as it were, we can call on the Lord for help to put off pride and doubting and put on humility and trust. You are no less a child of God because of the temptations you face in this area, and you will not benefit from trying to hide it from others. God's design is for Christians to be in loving community where we can trust each other and support each other. The church is the place where we can be honest about our sin. James 5 verse 16. Seek support in prayer and walk through our suffering together. 1 Corinthians 12 26. Find encouragement. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11. And arm one another with the truth that we need to grow. Ephesians 4 verse 15. It will be messy when we start to untangle some of the problems in our lives, but it will be good. We need to stick it out, being patient and gracious to one another, because God usually works in us over time. Communicate to your family in an age-appropriate way, when kids are concerned, about what you're facing. Then seek advice and a listening ear from mature brothers and sisters who have a track record of going to God's Word. 
Remember, in healthy churches, that will include elders who are watching over your souls. Hebrews 13 verse 17. Wise pastors should be able to help you filter through the challenges that you're facing to reveal what are the matters of faith and where medical help is warranted. There is a temptation to not talk to those around us because it will be awkward and uncomfortable. Then when it gets bad, we run off and try and find absolution from someone who is relationally distant to us. Professional help may well be needed, but don't short-circuit God's pastoral engine by trying to outsource it. God's church is a hospital for matters of mind and heart, and Christ is our attending physician. If you've fallen prey to worldly thinking on this matter, or perhaps you're second-guessing your choices, don't be weighed down by shame or retreat, but step forward to find assurance and help. Christ and his people are here to help.